Hello everyone, welcome to Knights of the Round, your channel for all things D&D. I'm your host, Mythos, and today we're going to be embarking on uh, kind of a new and kind of an old journey. I'm going to be starting The Lost Minds of Fandelver and Fandelver and Below. I know originally I set out on a path, but I got a new webcam, and I got a new laptop, and I got some new editing software, so... Here we are. I thought that it would be good for us to go over both campaigns together as one. For all of the people out there who may not have access to the campaign, this essentially is why I'm doing it. I guess I want to get away from strictly being a DM guide for the campaigns. Why I want to produce this content is like I said, for all those people out there who may not have access to the campaign. So what we're going to be doing today and in videos to follow this is we're going to be going over the campaign sort of step by step. Yes, I will be reading from the campaign, um, but also I'm going to be giving thoughts and insights as they occur to me. <clears throat> you can Use this as ASMR if you'd like, or you can get in a long car ride and just put this in and listen to it if you'd like to, but this essentially is, is the way that we're going to be going. And I prepared a sort of a disclaimer that I'd like to read now for uh, just for everyone, just to kind of to get started on, on what we're going to be doing. So... These videos are not intended as Dungeon Master Guides, as I said. They are produced solely for educational and entertainment purposes. Campaigns featured may be reviewed and discussed from a Dungeon Master's perspective, but any guidance or directives provided in this video, in this video are of my own opinion and should be viewed as such. Also, I would like to talk about any comments that come across um, my channel. Uh, I'm of the mind that uh, respectful, helpful, encouraging comments are uh, more valuable to me and those of us who may subscribe to this channel than disrespectful or disparaging comments. So I just wanted to kind of move forward, letting everyone know that if I receive any such comments, they won't last long on my uh, channel. So just be mindful of what you're about to post before you post it. And having said that, let's jump right in. So as I said, we're going to be doing The Lost Minds of Fandelver and Fandelver and Below as one campaign. And I'm going to be giving insights as they occur to me, as I said. Um, I will be reading, so um, just kind of buckle up for that. And I'm sharing my screen so that it will help all of those people out there who may not look, know what the campaign looks like may not have access to the books, you can come to my channel and you can see for yourself um, what the campaign looks like. And we can sort of discuss what changes to this campaign may look like. So <clears throat> I'm going to jump right in. So this is Fandolin. This is a picture of what Fandolin is supposed to look like before the events of I guess, Fandelver and below when things start going awry and uh, people start changing and transforming. And we're going to get into that in a bit. But this is just sort of a template of what uh, Wizards of the Coast would like us, how they would like us to view Fandolin. So here we go. A welcome to Fandolin. Nestled in the Sword Coast, uh, between Neverwinter Wood and the Sword Mountains is the town of Fandolin. Centuries ago, Fandolin was a thriving settlement with deep ties to its neighboring communities, but then bandits overran the town and Fandolin lay abandoned for centuries. Only in the past few years have settlers built a new village on the ruins of the old. <clears throat> Excuse me. These townsfolk hope to grow Fandolin through hard work, camaraderie, and the shared purpose of building a lasting home. Threatening their efforts and their survival are bandits, brigands, and monsters. Threats from below. And this is kind of where we get started. Unbeknownst to any townsfolk, 
Three Mind Flayer fanatics lurk deep underneath the town and plot a chilling course. The fanatics wor worship Ilvash, a godlet from the Far Realm, who is determined to reestablish a Mind Flayer empire on the material plane. Ilvash wants this empire to stretch across Turil's surface, starting with Phandalin as its capital. The Mind Flayer fanatics have discovered pieces of a shattered obelisk of great magical power left over from the mysterious Netherese Empire that once occupied part of this region. After reviewing the remaining fragments, the fanatics plan to infuse the reconstructed obelisk with Ilvash's unholy energy and return Fandalin's population, or turn Fandalin's population, into Mind Flayers loyal to their evil godlet. This plot is a complex affair, but the Mind Flayers beneath Fandalin have many allies. As pe petty bandits vie for control of Fandalin, the fanatics' allies quietly search for pieces of the shattered obelisk. How successful those allies are, and whether Fandalin's heroes can stop the will of an evil godlet, is exactly what you're about to find out. And this is sort of the beginning of my, well, I don't know, advice or exposition on this. I just wanted to speak to the fact that these campaigns are very, very different. The Lost Minds of Fandelver kind of came, you know, uh, under the heading of a starter set for D&D. &D. So this is for players who haven't ever played D&D &D before, who are just sort of getting their feet wet, so to speak. And it sort of eases them into the game and introduces them to elements of the game to get them used to possibly what they may be facing in the future. And really, kind of the tone of the Lost Minds of Fandelver doesn't really get too sinister. You know, there are the red brands and there's, uh, there's glass staff and there's the spider and they aren't really murdering anybody. They aren't enslaving anybody. The spider's looking for the well, uh, is it the well of souls? The forge of souls? I think it's the forge of souls. And we don't really know why. So we know there's danger, but there isn't anything really threatening like this impending doom upon Fandolin. That all changes with Fandelver and Below, with the addition of Fandelver and Below, which is kind of odd because these two are linked together into one campaign. So I like to view the Lost Minds of Fandelver as kind of like this cool, tepid water. It's kind of pleasant to be in, and Fandelver and Below is just being thrown into the fire. Not only because of the tone, because the tone is one of like cosmic horror, where they're, they are trying to take over the minds of people. They are trying to enslave people. They, they will not stop at murdering people. They will kidnap people. They want to use Fandolin as their capital, as their foothold into the Forgotten Realms. They, they would like to change the Forgotten Realms into something like what the Far Realm is, which is much more, <clears throat> excuse me, much, much more sinister and dark. And that's my phone. Sorry about that. And that's my phone again. Really sorry. So... Anyway, I just wanted to illustrate the difference between the two, um, just so that you can get an idea of what's going to be happening. And we'll get into what can change, what DMs should be looking to change um, in the future. But I'm going to continue on now. About this book, Fendelver and Below, The Shattered Obelisk, is a Dungeons & Dragons adventure optimized for four to six characters. The player characters are the heroes of the story. This book describes the villains and monsters the heroes must overcome and the locations they must explore to bring the adventure to a successful conclusion. This adventure presents Fandolin, the surrounding region, and the Underdark below as a campaign setting in which you can base adventures of your own. All pertinent details about the setting are covered in this book with room to add new locations and villains of your own design. So I have a few things to say about this. The first thing was this adventure is optimized for four to six players. I think mostly it is, but I do think that they put they put some some creatures and some encounters in the game that are going to be of a deadly 
rating as far as encounter goes, even for six players. So DMs, you, you need to be aware of the encounters that your players are going to be facing because you probably will need to scale them back. The next thing I want to say is about all pertinent details about the setting are covered in this book. Um, I think that they did a fair job. I don't think that all avenues are covered, and really this gets into what I think about modules and the books. I, I think that they cover kind of the bare bones and maybe a little bit more of what the campaign should be, but they don't cover everything, and this is where DMs need to come in. They need to know the campaign, and they need to know where to expand in the campaign to you know, just to offer more content for your players. Um, as far as with room to add villains and locations, I'm not sure about the locations, but there are plenty of villains in this story. I'm not sure. Um, at first there's, you know, there's, there's a uh, glass staff, there's the spider, there's, what was it King Grohl and Clark? And um, not only that, but when you get into Fandelver and below, there's, there's no shortage of villains there as well. So continuing on. The Adventure Summary. The Adventure Summary is split into two halves, A Lost Mine. Chapters 1 through 4 imagine or reimagine the beloved adventure of Lost Minds of Fandelver, originally published in 2014, ooh, 10 years ago, with the D&D starter set. The heroes begin in Chapter 1 at first level and end Chapter 4 at fifth level. The Obelisk. Chapters 5 through 8 chronicle the Mind Flayer fanatics plot against the town people of Phandalin. The heroes begin chapter 5 at 5th level and end chapter 8 at 12th level. When this adventure dawns, the adventurers embark on a simple mission to Phandalin, whether it's helping a dwarf patron or following another prompt. The Mind Flayer fanatics' activities beneath Phandalin are invisible for most of the first four chapters. If the players don't wish to delve into themes of unseen horror, evil fanatics, or malevolent elder entities, you can easily end the adventure at the conclusion of chapter four. If you do so, replace the psionic goblins in chapter one through four with goblins from the monster manual and end the adventure once the characters defeat Nazar what's next the what's next section at the end of chapter four provides more information if you're using this option there's no need for the heroes to return to Fandolin and thus kick off the events in chapter five and beyond if you'd like to stop at chapter four right after defeating nazar you and your merry band of adventurers can part ways at that point you do not need to continue to chapter five, or you can just pretend, or you can just run the, run the game in such a way that when you return to Phandalin, the events of chapter five never really happen, and that everybody's happy to see you, and that you come back with great news defeating the spider, and all is well with the land, and you can now go, go about your merry way. So next we're going to be running into the, the the campaign summarizes all of the chapters from chapter one to chapter eight. I'm going to kind of be stopping periodically. You guys can read this on your own. You can pause the video and, and uh, read this on your own. And so here is a nice, nice depicted picture of two... Uh, two goblins squabbling. It's entitled The Cragmaw. Goblins plague Fandolin and surrounding areas. So, the obelisk. If your players wish to continue the story past chapter 4, they'll find a tale of ancient magic, a malevolent godlet, and, and fanatics obsessed with transforming innocence into mind flayers faithful to Ilvash. After they wrap up chapters 1 through 4, the characters discover that psionic goblins have committed crimes of vandalism in Phandalin. Investigating the crime scenes reveals that the goblins are searching for pieces of the titular shattered obelisk. Chasing down the goblins reveals their connection to a sobering plot against Phandalin. The characters learn that mind flayers who serve Ilvash are behind this plot. These mind flayer fanatics are renegades who hope to reconstruct and harness the power of the obelisk. Using the obelisk to focus wicked far realm power, the mind flayer fanatics plan to enact a ritual to transform Phandalin's people into mind flayers. 
The characters must follow the Mind Flayers into their Underdark stronghold and then into the Far, far Realm if they hope to save save Phandalin from certain doom. I was actually surprised when I read this that your players actually need to go into the Far Realm uh, itself. So that's pretty cool. Um, so here's going to be chapter five through eight's summary. Again, you can pause the video and read this for yourself. Um, we're going to get a nice shot of the obelisk here. Um, I'm going to go into here to show you guys what the obelisk kind of really looks like. So this is the obelisk um, completed and this is ultimately what uh, the Mind Flayer fanatics, the Sawplate Goblins, are trying to reconstruct with the fragments of the obelisk. This is the completed version. It's got this kind of deathly, sickly green uh, power flowing through it, and you can see kind of these the the kind of the taint of the dark realm tendrils of. I don't know magic or malevolence, kind of reaching out for the obelisk. So. That's a pretty good depiction, in my opinion. So here's chapter 7 and chapter 8 summary. And we're going to begin um, by running the adventure. I'm not sure if I really need to go over this very, very closely, because there are a lot of people, in fact, I would say most people, if they haven't run this adventure already, they've they've run a similar adventure. This just gives kind of the the rules for for running the campaign, and it's it's very easy. Um, it suggests that you use the player's handbook, dungeon master's guide, and monster's manual, which not everybody has, but maybe players in your party has a book or two that you can look off of, or you you may even be able to check these books out from your local library. I know for my library, um, they have a program where if you'd like to see a book that they don't have, you can actually order that book and they have it to where when the book comes in, you are actually the first person that gets to rent that book because you were the one to order it. So if you don't have the cash for the player's handbook, Dungeon Master's Guide, or Monster's Manual, you may be able to rent it from your library or you may be able to um, have your library actually pay the money to get the book in and then you can rent it from them. This goes over using uh, how to use the maps, uh, interior maps that appear in this book are for DMs eyes only. And so there's going to be, there's gonna, for DMs out there, there's going to be two maps. There's going to be a map for your eyes, and then there's going to be a map for your player's eyes. And we'll go into this map for us. And we'll just kind of see where everything is. Mount Hot Now. Is that what? Is that what that says? Mount Hot Now? All right. So here's Neverwinter. This is where you're going to be starting. There's Thunder Tree. I think Thunder Tree and uh, Thunder Tree here and Agatha's Lair here are two quests that you're going to be embarking on in uh, Lost Mines of Fendelver. Um, here's Kragmaw Castle and the Kragmaw Hideout. So I'm guessing this area right here is where the ambush is going to be happening because uh, as we're going to see when we get into the map, there actually is, it's somewhere in here. It's somewhere in here. But here's Phandalin right here, Wave Echo Cave, Zorzula's Rest. If you don't know what Zorzula's Rest, you're soon going to find out. Probably not in this video, but Zorzula's Rest is our first dungeon crawl of is uh, of Fandelver and below. That's going to be our first dungeon crawl of Fandelver and below. I was going to say Lost Mines of Fandelver, but that's actually not true. Um, here's Wyvern Tor, the old Owlwell. So these places, Agatha Lair, Old Owlwell, Wyvern Tor, and Thunder Tree, these are going to be locations that you're going to be visiting in the Lost Mines of Fandelver. Um, and, uh, for Fandelver and below, it's going to be Zorzula's Rest, and then up here at Gibbet Crossing and the Talhundreth and the Crypt of the Talhund. So, so that you guys can see that. And then we're going to continue on down below where they're going to be talking about non-deadly solutions. So just in case you were unaware, you don't have to kill everything in Dungeons & Dragons. That's why we have ability checks such as Intimidation or Persuasion or, or Deception. You know, you, you can lie, you can try to deceive, you can you can try and buy off people. 
that's what that all is for. And it's this is just reminding you that you don't always have to pull your sword out of its scabbard. You could try and talk your way out. <clears throat> And this goes over the Forgotten Realms, uh, what the Forgotten Realms is and what it isn't. Um, and then we're going to continue on to character creation. This is, this is all very, very basic stuff. Essentially, this is just an introduction to the Lost Minds of Fandelver. Um, and obviously, as I've said before, as I'm going through this stuff, if I'm not going through it to your satisfaction, you can pause the video and, and read the stuff at your own leisure. So this gives all of the backgrounds, I, I suppose, that are allowed in Lost Minds of Fandelver, of which there are not many. You get the acolyte, the charlatan, criminal, entertainer, folk hero, art, guild artisan, hermit, noble, outlander, sage, sailor, and soldier. So there are not many backgrounds that are offered um, for this. So DMs, you know, use your discretion when, when offering certain backgrounds to your players. And here are the adventure hooks. And this is, of course, Gundren Rockseeker right here. A nice little picture of him. Players can invent their own reasons for visiting Phandalin, or they can use the following adventure hooks. The character hooks tied to the backgrounds can also provide characters with motivations for visiting Phandalin. It's recommended that at least one character use the Meet Me in Phandalin adventure hook below so that the party has a tie to the dwarf Gundren Rockseeker who plays a prominent role in chapters 1 through 4. Uh, so, Meet Me in Phandalin. You are in the city of Neverwinter when your dwarf patron and friend, Gundren Rockseeker, hires you to escort a wagon to Phandalin. Gundren has gone ahead with a warrior, Sildar Hallwinter, to attend business in town while you follow with the supplies. You will be paid a whopping 10 gold pieces each by the owner of Barthen's provisions in Phandalin when you deliver the wagon safely to the trading post. The next adventure hook would be uh, your friend of the Harpers. You've spent much time, you've spent much of your life in awe of the Harpers, a secret organization dedicated to promoting good and preserving history. You've always wanted to join, but you've struggled with the group's attention. You're headed to Phandalin where you hope that your good deeds will gain the Harpers' notice. And so you guys may or may not know, but Sister Gorel, Sister Gorel at the Shrine of Luck in Phandalin is an agent of the Harpers. Um, it doesn't say here, but uh, the Zentarim are sort of the antithesis to the Harpers. They, they're they looking for power. They're looking for influence. Um, I sort of look at the Zentarim as kind of the mafia, kind of a, an organization that promotes organized crime in Phandalin, and they too have an agent in, in Phandalin as well. I, I forget who she is. I think she's a dwarf, though. A gauntlet trainee. You have pledged yourself to the Order of the Gauntlet, a devout and vig a vigilant group that seeks to protect others from evildoers. Before you become a full-fledged member, you've decided to meet your hero, a retired adventurer named Darren uh, Ed Edermath who is part of the Order and who has thwarted many local threats. Darren lives in Phandalin in a cottage beside an apple orchard. You plan to visit him and drink in his wisdom before joining the Order yourself. That seems pleasant. Okay, starting, starting the adventure. When this adventure begins, the characters are in Neverwinter. Consider telling the characters that they'll join the same wagon headed to Phandalin, whether it's because they're working for the Dwarf Gundren Rock Seeker, or they have another reason to go to the frontier town, no matter the character's motivation, allow them to join the wagon without additional cost, narrating how each character secured passage as needed. If you establish why the characters are traveling together before you kick off the adventure, your later game will go uh, more smoothly. So a uh, piece of advice here, your characters really need to care about Phandalin and its people, especially if you're going to be moving on to Fandelver and below. You, you need a reason to go to Phandalin. Maybe, maybe you live in Phandalin. Maybe you grew up in Phandalin. Maybe you have a relationship with an NPC in Phandalin. Maybe your wife resides in Phandalin or 
you know, your son or daughter or whoever lives in Fandolin, maybe the, they were one of the ones that got kidnapped. You know, essentially your players need to have some skin in the game. They, they need to have a reason to go. And also if they had a reason to go that kind of meshed with Fandelver and Blow, that would be great as well. Wizards of the Coast didn't do such a great job at making a seamless transition between one campaign and another. They actually could have done a lot better, in my opinion. So DMs out there, you need to come up with ways that uh, Lost Minds of Fandelver and Fandelver and Below are going to be tied together. You can drop hints, you can drop clues, you can you can provide rumors, you can have the players have horrific nightmares and, and things like that. You can have NPCs that know something that that maybe the the players have to kind of intimidate out of them or whatever. But that's that's what really needs to happen. You need to try to make a seamless trans transition for your players to go into Fandelver and below. And your players need, if you're not having one of these adventure hooks, come up with a reason they may want to go. All right, so we're going to be getting into the Far Realm influence. In this adventure, Far Realm devoted fanatics seek to transform Fandelin's residence into Mind Flayers devoted to the evil godlet Ilvash. How are they going to do that? That seems pretty evil to me. Even before the fanatics attempt to finish their ritual in Chapter 8, their influence over the town infuses the place with energy from the Far Realm. The townspeople begin to change in troubling ways. Fandolin's buildings and surrounding environment also experience a withering that gives the entire town an air of decay. And one of the ways that you could make it a seamless transition from, from one campaign to the next is when they first arrive in Fandolin, in chapter one, you can start talking about the weather looking gray. Maybe it's summertime. Maybe it's uh, maybe the townspeople are like looking up at the sky. Like, Where's the sun? Or maybe you have people that are normally chipper and effervescent, feeling kind of down and depressed, and they're not really sure why. Maybe you're starting to see some really, really odd foliage, sickly and nasty and thorny kind of growing in an area that maybe you might pass several times that you can see that it's growing into something sinister. Use your discretion. Uh, where was I? Okay, transformation of Fandolin. Each time the characters return to Fandolin uh, during the latter parts of this adventure, they find the town and townspeople further affected by the Far Realm. The transformations become noticeable in Chapter 5 and worsen until the character uh, confrontation with the fanatics in the Far Realm during Chapter 8. The illustrations in these chapters depict this burgeoning transformation. Use the following descriptions when the characters are in town to add further sinister flavor to the adventure. Each description's effects are cumulative with the previous chapter's effects. So in Chapter 5, this is everything for Fandelver and Below is supposed to st start in Chapter 5, but if your, your, your players plan on playing through from Chapter 1 all the way to Chapter 5, why wait, you know? Why wait on on providing some of that content just so they can start your their characters can start to feel kind of the emergence of the dark not the dark realm but the far realm into their plane of existence. So in chapter five, the sky over Fandolin is perpetually gray and its buildings seem more drab than normal. The townspeople appear tired and wan. In chapter 6, nearly imperceptible scaly fungi grow between the, tra the cracks in Fandolin's buildings and cobblestones. The townspeople begin to seem unwell. In chapter 7, invasive fleshy weeds grow like tentacles along Fandolin's buildings and streets. The townspeople develop strange symptoms. And in chapter 8, Fandolin's sky becomes a bright sickly green color. The fleshy weeds grow thicker and longer, wrapping around the buildings and beams like stalks. The townspeople sprout tentacles and become irrationally angry and violent. And down below, we have a lovely illustration of what that is supposed to look like. So, 
oh, we've got some lovely characters here that are obviously being taken over by the far realm energy. You can you can look at the the houses and the background, and they're growing these ugly red vines off of them. Even the sky behind is like it said, it's a, a sickly green color. Is that supposed to be the sun in the background? Like you don't know. It's this is the emergence of the far realm into the forgotten realms. And these dudes are ugly. So there's that. So character transformation, this is going to detail how your characters transform um, the stages of transformation when, when the characters can start expecting different transformations to start taking place and what those transformations may look like. Uh, if the fanatics are successful, the characters might transform into mind flayers. See the end of chapter eight. Characters from outside the region might not be affected by the far realm ritual, although these details are up to you. Even if the characters don't turn into mind flayers, they experience increasing changes as the fanatics plot uh, progresses. So this is basically telling you that player consent is required. Most people would just consent. There may be some people that will not consent to this kind of cosmic horror. Um, before you use character transformation rules presented in this section, check with each player to determine if they're open to their character experiencing physically transformative effects. A player will not miss game benefits if they choose to not use these rules for their character. So if you have a player that would rather not use these transformative effects. They're not supposed to suffer any loss from the game because they decided not to opt in um, in this way. Maybe you can just come up with some story as to why this player may be immune. Again, that's up to you. The stages of character transformation. As the influence of the far realm on a character increases, they begin to change. There are four stages of transformation, each with increasingly extreme events. Characters begin at stage one at the start of uh, chapter five. They advance to the next stage at the beginning of each subsequent chapter. So stage, stage two in chapter six, stage three in chapter seven, and stage four in chapter eight. To determine how a character changes as their transformation stage increases, to control, consult the transformation effects table. The examples listed under the transformations are only suggestions. You can create other transformations of a similar scope. So one of the ways that you can increase player agency is you don't have to choose one of the transformations that they have in the table below. Your character or your player can choose which transformation they would like to see happen in their character. You know, uh, maybe it, it, it helps, you know, immerse the character more. It gives them more, you know, player agency. Maybe they think their character would look cool with, you know, tentacles coming out of its back, like, you know, Doc Ock from Spider-Man or something like that. Allow them to role play it, you know, how they see fit. It, it makes it fun for them. As a character advances to higher stages of transformation, the effects from lower stages become more pronounced. For example, whispers may become insistent, or the tentacles larger, or another one may sprout. NPCs and creatures are likely to notice, notice the character stage strange behavior. The changes to the character's bodies or any reality warping effects when the characters are nearby. At your discretion, the attitudes of creatures might change when they notice these mutations, depending on the nature of the change, the personality and background of the creature, and the circumstances of the discovery. So, at your discretion, these transformations might have in-game effects. For instance, the voices that whisper to a character may provide a useful clue. Or, a character might hear a telepathic conversation between creatures who speak with their minds. A character may gain advantage on a charisma check to persuade an aberration that sees the character's transformations. Um, so, sky's the limit here. You, In this way, you can use the character's transformations to their advantage. And I think that's really cool. So, directly below here, we have the what kind of transformations they can 
see affecting their character. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read stage four just right off. You guys can pause this and read this in its entirety, but I'll read stage four for you. The character connection to the Far Realm has grown to the extent that they now warp reality within 30 feet of them in one of the following ways. So this is determined by rolling a d6. On a 1, the creatures cast no longer cast shadows. On a 2, uh, portable objects not being worn or carried change position. 3, mirrors don't show reflections, like a vampire. On a 4, animals are spooked. 5, perishable food spoils. And 6, the temperature increases or decreases. These are pretty benign. You can come up with your own, um, and you would actually probably do a better job of that. So here we've got a picture of a, a sopley goblin um, with an elongated skull, different colored skin, kind of a brownish, tannish skin with uh, purple or indigo, indigo markings or tattoos, and obviously the green energy um, surrounding their hands. And I guess it's holding a fragment of, of the obelisk. So we're going to continue on, and this is actually where the journey begins. I don't know why I just thought of The Hobbit just now. Okay, so chapter one. Uh, more than 500 years ago, clans of dwarves and gnomes made an agreement known as the Fandelver Pact, by which they would go, by which they would share a rich mine in a wondrous cavern known as Wave Echo Cave. In addition to its mineral wealth, the mine contained great magical power. Human spellcasters allied themselves with dwarves and gnomes to channel and bind that energy into a great forge called the Forge of Spells, where magic items could be crafted. Ch times were good, and the nearby town of Phandalin prospered as well. But disaster struck when bandits swept through the north and laid waste to all in their path. A powerful bandit force reinforced by evil mercenary wizards attacked Wave Echo Cave to seize its riches and magic treasures. Human wizards fought alongside their dwarf and gnome allies to defend the Forge of Spells, and the ensuing battle destroyed much of the cavern. Few survived the cave-ins and tremors, and knowledge of the location of Wave Echo Cave was lost. For centuries, rumors of buried riches have uh, attracted treasure seekers and opportunists to the area around Phandalin, but no one has located the lost mine. In recent years, people resettled the area, and Phandalin is now a rough and tumble frontier town. Recently, a trio of dwarves, the Rockseeker brothers, discovered the entrance to Wave Echo Cave. They intend to reopen the mines. Unfortunately for the rock seekers, they aren't the only ones interested in Wave Echo Cave. A mysterious villain known as the Spider controls a network of bandit gangs and goblin bands in the area, and his agents followed the rock seekers to their prize. The Spider wants Wave Echo Cave for himself, and he's taking steps to make sure that no one else knows where it is. So here we have a picture of possibly the the goblins attacking the uh, the caravan uh, entitled "The Road to Fan is Often Dangerous." So this is getting into uh, running this chapter. Um, this chapter begins with a goblin ambush on the road to Fandalin, leaving it up to the characters to chase their attackers into a cave lair. Before getting into the adventure's events, take a few minutes to do the following. Character introductions. Encourage the players to introduce the, their characters to each other if they haven't done so already. Connect to Gundren. Ask the players to think about how their characters came to know the dwarf Gundren Rockseeker. If applicable, let the players concoct their own stories. If a player is hard-pressed to think of anything, suggest something simple. For example, Gundren could be a childhood friend or someone who helped the player character ex escape a rough or tough situation. Transportation details. Ask the players how their characters are traveling. If the characters are escorting Gundren's wagon load of supply, wagon load of supplies, then one or two characters need to be driving the wagon. The rest of the characters can be riding in the wagon, walking alongside it, or scouting ahead. All right, character advancement. The characters should be first level when the chapter begins. 
The characters gain a level when they finish exploring the Kragma hideout. I love gaining levels. Maybe you guys do too. All right, the road to Phandalin. The adventure assumes you're using the Meet Me in Phandalin adventure hook for all your characters. The heroes are escorting a wagon load, a wagon full of provisions from Neverwinter to Phandalin. They're a half day's march from Phandalin when they run into trouble with goblin raiders from the Kragmaw Band. Read the following text to get the adventure started. If you're using another adventure hook, skip to the second paragraph and adjust the details as necessary, ignoring the information about driving the cart. So this is what you read. You begin your adventuring career in the city of Neverwinter. A dwarf named Gundren Rockseeker hired you to bring a wagon load of provisions to the rough and tumble settlement of Phandalin, a couple of days travel south of the city. Gundren was clearly excited and more than a little secretive about his reasons for the trip, saying only that he and his brothers had found something big and that he'd pay you ten, pieces, ten gold pieces each for escorting his supplies safely to Barthen's provisions, a trading post in Phandalin. He then set out uh, ahead of you on horse, along with, your war with a warrior escort named Sildar Hallwinter, claiming he'd need to arrive early to take care of business. You've spent the last few days following the high road south from Neverwinter, and you're just, you've just recently veered east along the Tribor Trail. You've had no trouble so far, but you know this territory can be dangerous. Bandits and outlaws have been known to lurk along this road. That is true. So this tells you about driving the, the wagon. No skills necessary to drive the wagon. Um, it tells you what's in the wagon and that the wagon's overall haul um, is totaling to around 100 gold pieces. So this is, these are the maps uh, about the goblin ambush here, um, depicting the ambush. So we'll just go into that real quick. And you guys can get a closer view of what this is supposed to look like. So you're coming down this road here, and here is where the horses are. And, well, we're going to read about it, but <clears throat> I just wanted you to get a, a kind of a visual of what you're going to be dealing with. You've been on the Tribor Trail for about a half a day and are nearing a side road leading south toward Phandalin. As you come around a bend, you stumble upon this battle. The woods press close to the trail here with a steep embankment and dense thickets on either side. Two horses wander the road, sniffing at ransacked effects. It's littered with arrows, torn scraps of fabric, and odds and ends discarded from Gundren's bags with the goblins when the goblins were looking for the map. If you're using the Meet Me and Phandalin adventure hook, any character who approaches the scene identifies the horses as belonging to Gundren Rockseeker and Sildar Hallwinter. It's up to the players to decide whether to bring these horses with them. When the characters inspect the scene closer, read the following. The horse's saddlebags have been looted. An empty leather map case lies nearby. So, four goblins are hiding in the woods, two on either side of the road. They wait until someone approaches the horses and then attack. The goblins fight to the death until one goblin remains alive. That goblin then flees and heads uh, for the goblin trail. So this goblin, you don't have to kill it. Like I said, you could, um, you could capture it. You could interrogate it. You could offer it gold. You could tell, you could tell it that as long as it's telling you everything you need to know. It gets to keep its life. I know that goblins are into self-preservation a lot. And if you're, and they often go to the side that, um, is going to provide them with life or, um, they all, they also follow the, the strongest leader. And if you're the only one there, they're going to follow you. So you could use this goblin to, uh, show you where the hideout is to, possibly get past the traps and um, you can see how far that goes so the development in the unlikely event that the goblins triumph they leave the characters unconscious loot them and the wagon and head to the Kragma hideout the characters can continue to fandolin but 
buy new gear at Barthen's Provisions, return to the ambush site, and find the goblins' trail, should they wish. The characters might capture one or more goblins by knocking them unconscious instead of killing them. A character can use any weapon that deals bludgeoning damage to knock a goblin unconscious, succeeding if the attack deals enough damage to drop the goblin to zero. The goblin regains consciousness after a few minutes and can be convinced to share information. The goblin can also be persuaded to lead the party to Kragma hideout and guide the party around the traps along the way. The characters might not find the goblin trail or they could decide to continue to Fandolin. In that case, skip to chapter two. Elmina Barthen, the owner of Barthen's Provisions, seeks out the characters and informs them that Gundren Rock Seeker never arrived. She recounts the goblin troubles and suggests the characters return to the ambush site to investigate further after they rest. Barthen also tells the party that Lenine Greywind of the Iron Shield Coster can provide more information on the goblin attacks. And here it looks like we have a picture of the goblins lying in wait for the, um, the caravan to go by. So, what the goblins know, or what the Kragmaws know. Um, if you were to capture one of these goblins and start asking it questions, this is what it might know. Bugbear leader. Their leader is a bugbear named Clarg. Clark report, reports to King Grohl, leader of the Kragmaw Band, who dwells in Kragmaw Castle. The goblins can provide basic directions to Kragmaw Castle. It's about 20 miles northeast in Neverwinter Wood. Capturing Gundren. Clark received a message received a messenger goblin from King Grohl a few days ago. The messenger told him that someone named the Spider was paying the Kragmaws to capture Gundren Rockseeker and send him and anything he was carrying to King Grohl. Clark followed King Grohl's orders. Gundren was ambushed and taken with his personal effects, including a map, to King Grohl. Sildar's Location Gundren's human companion is being held in the Eating Cave. About 15, about 15 goblins currently dwell in this hideout. Strange goblins. Okay, so this is the first attempt by Wizards of the Coast to let you know it's trying to merge the two campaigns. Um, so, strange goblins. Recently, strange goblins have sometimes joined the Kragmaws in their roadside ambushes, though not today. These, these strange goblins have elongated skulls and glowing green energy surrounds their weapons when they attack. The Kragmaw goblins don't know who these newcomers are. The new goblins simply cackle and leave after each attack. The Kragmaws are afraid of these strange goblins and think the characters should be too. This is a refer reference to the psionic abilities that factor more prominently in later chapters. All right. Goblin Trail. After the characters defeat the goblins, any inspection of the area reveals that the creatures have been using this place to stage ambushes for some time. On, an, on the north side of the road, the characters can easily find a trail behind the thickets that lead northwest. A character who succeeds on a DC-10 wisdom survival check recognizes that about a dozen goblins have come and gone along the trail. The character also sees signs of two human-sized bodies being hauled from the ambush site. The drivers can easily steer the wagon off the road and tie off the oxen before the characters pursue the goblins. The trail leads five miles northwest and ends at the Kragma hideout. Ask the players to determine the character's marching orders as they follow the trail. The order is important because the goblins have set two traps along the trail to thwart pursuers. So DMs out there, if you are playing with newer players that maybe have never played D&D &D before, you don't actually need to wait for someone to ask um, if, hey, can I recognize, you know, where the goblins have gone? You say roll a, DT, a DC tent or a, roll a wisdom survival check. You can just, you can just say, um, you know, at, you know, as you survey 
Um, okay. So, so now we run into the snare and the pit trap. So these are the two traps that are outside the Kragma hideout. About 10 minutes after heading down the trail, characters on the path encounter a hidden snare. If the characters are searching for traps, the character in the lead must succeed on a DC 15 wisdom or perception check to notice the snare. If the character fails the check, the snare triggers. The character must succeed on a DC 10 dexterity saving throw or be flipped upside down and suspended 10 feet above the ground. The character has the restrained condition until one point of slashing damage is dealt to the snare's cord. A character who isn't lowered carefully takes 1d6 bludgeoning damage from the fall. Or can just take 3 bludgeoning damage if you guys are running the take half um, house rule. For the pit trap, after 10 minutes of traveling down the trail, the characters encounter a pit trap the goblins have camouflaged. The pit is 6 feet wide, 10 feet deep, and triggers when a creature moves across it. The character in the lead must succeed on a DC 15 wisdom perception check to spot the hidden pit. If the character fails the check, they must succeed on a DC 10 dexterity saving throw or fall in the pit, taking 1d6 bludgeoning damage. The pit's walls aren't steep, so no ability check is required to scramble from the pit. So, um, as I said, if you, if you capture a goblin and you're holding its life above its head, it may just get you past these two traps. And I'm noticing that we are approaching, uh, the hour mark on this video and I wanted to kind of end it here so that in our next video, we're going to be going over the Kragma hideout and what um, your players can expect in there. So for now, I just um, I just want to say thank you to you guys for listening. If you listened uh, all the way through, I, I know it probably was difficult listening to my ums and uhs, but you know, this is me. I'm a real person. It isn't an AI voice like I've done in the past. And when you get a real person, you get. <laughs> you naturally get mistakes. Um, aside from that, um, I just want to thank you guys for, for any, for any positive or encouraging comment you may leave. Um, maybe you can tell me how your DM has run things in the past that might help people, um, in the future, you know, possibly when they, they watch this video and they can go back and read your awesome comments and maybe they can, um, implement some of the things that you know maybe you were discussing in your comment other than that if you could leave a a, a like and possibly a subscription i know you guys have probably heard this a, a million times it really does help and it's such a small thing uh, more content in the future so this is uh mythos signing off on um kind of the flagship video on me kind of switching gears from what I've been doing in the past and hopefully you guys like it. So uh, have a, have a great day and uh, may the odds be ever in your favor. Have a good one.